Good morning and welcome to Ceramic Storytime with Sue. I'm Sue McLeod and today I'm going to be reading to you one of my newest blog posts called What Glazes Can You Make with Limited Materials? So I'm just going to make sure that everything's working. Um, so if you're here and you can see me and hear me, please say hello in the comment section. Um, and I'm just going to confirm that before I continue uh, because I seem to have technological difficulties quite often. Okay, I think I'm live. So welcome. So yeah, I'm going to read um, my blog post, What Glazes Can You Make With Limited Materials? Um, I just wrote this post um, as kind of a response to one of my first blog posts that I ever wrote, which gives a shopping list of materials that you can buy if you're just getting, getting started um, and you want to mix glazes from scratch and you aren't really sure which materials you should have on hand. So I have a post that lists um, some basic materials that you can use. And then what I found was people were going out and buying the, these materials and not knowing which recipes they could make with them. So um, this post is in response to that. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read through the blog post. Um, and then after that, and basically, so what I've done is I've taken a bunch of my glaze recipes and I've reformulated them so that they use only the materials on that shopping list. And so I'm going to go to glazy.org, which is a glaze calculation software. And I'm going to um, show you how I did those material substitutions um, because sometimes like you might find a recipe where um, you have all the materials except one and you're, you might be wondering, oh, well, do I have to go out and buy this material? Maybe you could make it using the materials that you have. Um, and a lot of materials can be substituted for other materials. Um, so I'm going to kind of show you how to do that. Hello, Joan and Lynn and Anki. Awesome. Great to have you all here. Um, so if you want to follow along, um, the link that's scrolling across the bottom of the screen is bit.ly forward slash limited materials. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so that will bring you to this blog post here. Um, and then you can also, if you want to download a copy of this post, you can click here and then you enter your email address and then I will send that to you. So, hello, Nathan from Denver. Okay, so I'm going to clean up my screen a little bit and hide this. Get that out of the way. Okay, so I'll start by reading this blog post and then we'll move over to glazy.org and um, where you can watch me do some material sub substitutions. Um, feel free to ask questions. And then in the email that I sent out, um, I also said that I would take some recipe suggestions. So if you have a glaze recipe that you want to make, um, if it's already in Glazy, where I can just click the link and find it easily, mm -hmm. then I can help you do a material substitution. And so if, if there are any suggestions, just post the link in the comment section. Otherwise, I'll I'll just show you how I um, did the material substitutions with my own glaze recipes. <clears throat> um, Asta, hello from India. Wonderful. Um, Nathan says, wish I could stay, but I have to work. Can you send out the link to the recording? Yeah, so the recording is going to stay in the Facebook group. So if you're here watching me right now, that means you're in the Facebook group. And then the recording is just going to stay here. And then I will also upload it to this blog post. Um, so it will show up below this blog post. And then it'll be on my YouTube feed and my Facebook page and my Instagram feed. And it kind of goes everywhere after it's done. So you'll be able to see it. Hello, Isabel from Montreal. Wonderful. Okay. So feel free to comment, ask questions. I'm going to be monitoring the chat. Um, one little thing is 
Um, so if you're new to coming, watching me live, um, I actually can't see your name attached to your comment unless you give Facebook permission. So I'm just going to post um, a link to where you can give Facebook permission. And um, so I just posted that into the comments. Um, and so I will, um, if you click that link, then I'll be able to see your name attached to your comment. Um, okay, wonderful. Uh, Nathan says, thank you. You're an invaluable resource to the ceramics community. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, thank you so much. You're making a big difference in the world and bringing a lot of joy to people's lives. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Nathan, so much. That means a lot to hear you say that. Um, so I love doing this and I am happy to do it and I will keep doing it um, for as long as we have the internet. Okay, so what glazes can you make with limited materials? <clears throat> so when you don't have all the materials in a glaze recipe, when you start looking for glaze recipes and have a limited number of materials on hand, you may wonder, oh, whoops, you may find that you have almost, but not quite, all of the materials for a million glaze recipes, but you can't find a recipe that uses only the materials that you currently have. In 2016, I wrote a blog post called Start Mixing Your Own Glazes, a shopping list, where I offer a list of glaze materials that I would buy if I was just getting started and on a budget or had limited space. It was one of the very first blog posts I ever wrote before I had a Facebook group and an email list when no one was really paying any attention to my website. I hadn't really considered that someday people might actually read this blog post and then go out and buy all of these materials. So now that I've heard from several people who have done just that, I realize that more info is required for it to be super useful to a beginner. What glazes can be made with this list of materials? Why did I choose the materials that I did? Most glazes can be reformulated with different materials. When I start or when I created that list, it came from a place of knowing how to easily substitute glaze materials for each other. I knew that a lot of recipes out there could be reformulated to be made using the ingredients on the shopping list. For example, I knew that if a recipe called for wellastonite, which isn't on the list, I'd be able to substitute whiting and silica, which are on the list. The thing about glazes is that the recipe and material choice is less important than the chemistry of all the materials combined. You can recreate a glaze using different materials as long as the chemistry matches. So in creating this glaze material shopping list, it seemed very versatile to me, but I hadn't considered that many of the people who would buy this list of materials might not know how to reformulate glazes using material substitutions. So to make this shopping list more useful to everyone, um, and if you're on this blog post, you can click the links in this post and it will take you to the other post that has the shopping list and you can download that as well. Um, so to make this shopping list more useful to everyone, I decided that I would figure out which of my glaze recipes could be made using only these materials. It turns out that only my black velvet glaze and my calcium matte glaze matched the shopping list as they were written. And even so, black velvet contains cobalt, uh, which didn't make the list because of cost, and calcined EPK, which also isn't on the list, um, except for EPK is on the list, and you can make calcined EPK out of regular EPK. So these two glaze recipes kind of match the list, uh, but not, not completely. Um, so if you want to learn how to calcine your EPK, um, there's a, I have a blog post about that as well. So you can click that link to go to that blog post. So then I looked at the rest of my recipes and I realized that many of the base recipes could be reformulated using this list of materials. A base recipe is just the recipe without colorants added. So I went ahead and I reformulated all the recipes I could and ended up with nine different base recipes that can be made using the materials on the shopping list. 
I created a booked mark collection of these base glazes called Starter Materials Glazes on glazy.org. So if you're not familiar, glazy.org, which I'm gonna show you uh, at the end after I read this post, um, glazy.org, and here's a screenshot, uh, is a place where you can input your glaze recipes, you can add pictures, um, and then you can look at the chemistry of your recipes. And you can share your recipes with the public, you can keep them private if you want. Um, it's a really great, um, it's a really great software. It's a software, but it's a website. It's free to sign up um, original, or initially, so you can make an account. Um, and then there is an option as well, if you want to donate as little as $2 a month, um, then you can unlock a bunch of uh, extra features, which is awesome. And so um, I think it's well worth the price of admission. Um, so what was I saying here? Oh yeah, the bookmarks. Yeah, so in Glazy, you can take um, like a collection of recipes and you can bookmark them so that you can see them all at once. So that's what I did is I reformulated a bunch of my recipes using the materials on the shopping list and then I created a bookmarked collection in Glazy. So when you click this link here, um, that will take you to this bookmark collection. So all the glazes that are in this collection can be made using those materials. Okay, back on track. Here's an example of my clear glaze recipe before and after reformulating with different materials. The chemistry, UMF, which stands for Unity Molecular Formula, is inside the turquoise rectangle. So this turquoise rectangle here, oops, I just opened another tab uh, by clicking. So this rectangle here, um, this is the UMF. And so this is where it takes the recipe, all the physical materials that we combine to make a glaze recipe, and then it breaks them down into their individual elements like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, alumina, boron, silica, titanium, iron, and a little tiny bit of phosphorus. So um, you can have two different recipes, but if their chemistry matches, it doesn't really matter what the materials are. Um, the chemistry is what uh, dictates the outcome of the fired glaze. And so I took this clear glaze here. Um, so you can see these are the materials that I used to make it. And then I reformulated it here using these materials, which are on that um, beginner starter uh, shopping list. Um, and then the chemistry in these two boxes is pretty close to the same. So basically you're just looking at these numbers um, and trying to match them up. And if this window was bigger, uh, you could see them side by side. But I'll show you this in Glazy when we move over there. So <clears throat> uh, adding colorants and opacifiers. So what I did was I took um, the base recipes without the colorants and I reformulated those. And then you can add the colorants back into a glaze. So you can take any of these nine base recipes and add colorants to them to get a wide variety of colored glazes, depending on which colorants you have. On the shopping list, the only colorants I included were copper carbonate and red iron oxide in order to keep the cost down. Copper generally makes greens and blues and iron makes yellows and browns um, in oxidation. Um, so if you fire in a, like, in a gas reduction kiln, for example, then the colors are different. Uh, but most of us, I think, are firing electric oxidation. So another very common colorant you may wanna have on hand is cobalt, which makes blues and purples. Copper, iron, and cobalt are the three most common glaze colorants. Other less common colorants include manganese, nickel, and chrome. You may also want to have some opacifiers on hand to further increase your color options. Zircopax is the cheapest opacifier that doesn't have a big impact on the chemistry of the glaze. 
5 to 10% Zerka packs will turn a clear glossy glaze into a white glossy glaze. So an opacifier basically just um, blocks the transparency of the glaze. So you have a clear glaze that you can see through, then adding Zerka packs, which is an opacifier, it just creates a white glaze. So it's opacified so you can no longer see through it. Um, so if it starts out as a, a glossy glaze, um, adding Zerko packs is not going to change whether it's glossy or not. Um, then we have titanium dioxide and rutile, uh, which is titanium plus iron. And they are also opacifiers, but they play more of a role in the chemistry of the glaze, causing things like microcrystallization and variegated colors. So titanium and rutile are a little more involved in, um, in the outcome of the glaze and the chemistry, whereas Zircopax is a little more inert, where um, it's just kind of like a whitener, uh, whereas titanium um, can ca lead to crystallization during the cooling cycle. Um, so that can actually change uh, a glossy glaze to a matte glaze, depending on your cooling cycle and the um, the concentration of titanium in the glaze. Then we have tin oxide, which is um, the third opacifier. Um, it's the most expensive one and least common and is often used with chrome to make pink. Um, tin is also used in reduction glazes um, for copper reds sometimes. So tin isn't, um, it's probably the least common because it's very expensive, um, but it does serve a function in certain types of glaze recipes. But if you're just trying to um, opacify a glaze, uh, I would use Zircopax over tin just because of the cost. And Zircopax is um, zirconium silicate. So if you live somewhere else, it might not be called Zircopax, um, but the chemical formula is zirconium silicate. And so if you can find something along those lines, then that would be a good opacifier. Um, I recommend having at least one opacifier if you really want to experiment and have the most diverse options. You can test base recipes with different percentages of colorants. You can mix and match different colorants and you can combine colorants with opacifiers. There are an infinite number of possibilities when you start playing around with different percentages of all these glaze additives. Here are the most common percentages I see for the colorants and opacifiers. So this list um, is just generally like uh, what I see as being common. Um, you can certainly make glazes uh, with different percentages of these colorants, uh, but these are kind of like the range that you're gonna find most glazes fall within. Uh, so for copper carbonate, um, one to 4%. For cobalt carbonate, so cobalt is a little more powerful. It doesn't take as much cobalt to make blue um, as like, for example, copper or red iron. So cobalt, um, you could start with half a percent, um, up to 2%. 2% is usually quite a lot of cobalt for a glaze. Um, some people even uh, add less than half a percent of cobalt and you can still get some nice light blues. Uh, red iron oxide, one to 10%, manganese dioxide, one to 5%, chrome oxide is another super powerful colorant. Um, so 0.1% sometimes is often like that's all that's required. Um, if you're trying to make chrome tin pinks um, or some very subtle colors uh, with chrome, then 0.1%, so that's one tenth of a percent um, is sometimes all you need for that. So between 0.1 and 2% of chrome is uh, generally what I see in glaze recipes. The nickel oxide, 0.5 to 2%. And then our opacifiers down here, Zircopax, generally 5 to 10%. Rutile, 1 to 6%. Titanium dioxide. So rutile is titanium that has iron in it. Um, and then you can also get pure titanium dioxide, which uh, you would need a little bit less of, one to 4% um, than rutile. And then tin oxide is uh, one to 2%. So you can take a base recipe 
and then add colorants to it in different percentages to get different colored glazes. Uh, and you can vary the percentages. So you could try a glaze with like 1% copper and 2% copper and 3% copper, and then just see which concentration of copper that you like the best. Um, somebody asks, what does calcined EPK do versus regular EPK? Yeah, so um, EPK is kaolin, which is clay. So it's a type of clay that we add to our glaze recipes. Um, clay helps to keep our glazes suspended in the bucket. Um, but if you have too much clay in a glaze recipe, as we know, clay shrinks when it dries. And so even clay in a glaze recipe will also shrink when it dries. And so if you have a glaze recipe that has a lot of um, kaolin or EPK in it, um, I would say over 20% would be a, considered a lot. Um, then that glaze might shrink so much when it dries that the glaze will start cracking as the glaze is drying, um, which can lead to crawling during the firing. And so to remedy that, um, you can stick some EPK, put it through a bisque firing, which basically pre-shrinks it, um, pre-shrinks the EPK so that it doesn't then shrink while it's drying. Um, and then that reduces the shrinkage of your glaze, which can um, help with application issues that you can get from having too much EPK in a glaze recipe. Um, but if you wanna read more about that, um, I do have a, if you go to my blog and just search for calcine kaolin or calcine EPK, then I have a whole post that explains all of that. Um, Kate says, what is the ratio of titanium to iron in rutile? I believe rutile is 90% titanium, 10% iron. Um, so yeah, so it's mostly titanium with a little bit of iron, which also adds a bit of color to the glaze. Um, okay, so colorants. When adding colorants and opacifiers to a base recipe, you just take the glaze batch size and multiply it by the percentage of colorant to get the grams of colorant. For example, if you wanna add 2% colorant to a thousand gram batch of glaze, a thousand grams times 0 0.02, so that um, represents 2%, 0 0.02, equals 20 grams of colorant that you would add to a base recipe. So if you're making a thousand gram batch of glaze and the glaze calls for 2%, copper or you want to add 2% copper, then you would add 20 grams of copper. If you're making 10,000 grams, then you would add 200 grams of copper. So you're just kind of scaling the percentage of the colorants up with the batch size of the recipe. So now we have a list of base glazes that can be made with the limited materials on my shopping list just by taking existing recipes and substituting materials we don't have for ones we do have. And then we can add colorants as desired. Um, you can choose the colorants shown in my original recipes or try completely new ones. Um, if you test any of them, it would be great if you could upload your photos to the recipes on Glazy. So um, I'm going to go over to Glazy now. Do, do, do. Um, and I'm going to show you. So the recipes that I copied have photos attached to them, but then the copies of the new reformulated recipes don't have photos because I haven't actually tested the new batch. Um, theoretically, they should look the same as the original recipe, um, but sometimes changes in materials can lead to different variations. Um, so I don't want to, I would want to test the new recipe and then upload photos of those. So let me just, um, uh, get out of here and then go over to glazy. So I'm gonna try this side by side and hopefully uh, you can see enough of my screen to see what's going on. I can also um, do something like this, but I don't know if that's going to be, let me know. Let me know um, how this goes with 
seeing the, the screen of Glazy because there's a, can be a lot of info in a very small space. Um, let's see here. Facebook user says, can you add most colorants to most base glazes or are there some that don't work with every base recipe because they'd add fluxes? Yeah, so um, colorants do, a lot of the colorants are also fluxes um, and fluxes bring down the melting temperature of a glaze recipe. And so the the colorants also act as fluxes. Generally, since we're adding very small percentages of the colorants, they don't play a huge role, um, but they do. And so it could be that you take a base recipe um, and then add 3% copper to it and a glaze that wasn't running is now all of a sudden running. And so that is a thing that can happen, um, but that is something that you would need to kind of figure out by testing. Um, so it's kind of hard to predict what, if you have a glaze that's already a little bit runny, um, I would predict that adding copper carbonate, um, cobalt is also a flux, iron is a flux, um, that it would get a little bit runnier, but it also kind of depends on the chemistry of the base glaze. Um, so definitely you would wanna test uh, for sure, just to confirm that the, the glaze works the way that you are expecting it to. Okay, so let me take my bracelets off. They're making noise. Um, so here we have glazy.org and this is, um, I haven't logged into my account yet. And so this is what you would see when you click up, oops, can you see my arrow? So when you click this recipes link here, then um, you get a list of, these are all the most recent recipes that were added to Glazy. Um, and then you can, you can search for a term. So if you know the name of a glaze you wanna look up, you can search for it here. Um, you can look, you can search for clay bodies, slips, over glazes, under glazes, refractories. Um, I have a kiln wash recipe in here. So that would be under the refractory category. You can search for temperatures. So if you're working at cone six, you can click cone six. Um, and then it's just gonna show you glazes that are uh, rated for cone six. All atmospheres, so you can search for oxidation, reduction, salt and soda, wood, raku, kind of everything. And so it's up to the person who uploads the recipe into Glazy, how much of this information they fill out, whether it's gonna show up. So when you're uploading your recipes to Glazy, it's important that you um, specify a cone temperature. Um, so I generally um, just specify the temperature that I have fired it to. Um, but you can also, there's, you can give like the lowest cone and the highest cone. So if you know that a glaze, um, you know, is good from cone six to cone seven or cone eight, maybe, then you could put that in there. Um, but this is basically, um, if you don't, put an, an atmosphere, then it's not gonna show up. So cone six oxidation, then there's so many recipes that you can look for. So then um, I'm gonna log in here, my information. So you can create an account um, and then you can go to your home. So this is, uh, this is my, home page here. Um, and then this is the bookmark section where I've got starter materials glazes. So this is where I have all the glaze recipes that I reformulated using that um, shopping list. And so you can see that most of them don't have pictures yet uh, because I haven't tested them and uploaded any pictures. So, <clears throat> um, just checking the comments. So basically, I'm gonna show you how I took 
um, one of my glaze recipes, like it, one of our studio recipes at Cedar Hill Studio, which is where I work as a technician. Um, and then I reformulated that recipe just using the materials on the shopping list to get these recipes here. So I'm gonna start from scratch. Um, and if you have a recipe that you want me to do this with, again, you can post a link into the into Facebook and then I will do, um, I can do your recipe afterwards. Um, and then I also want to just pull up um, the shopping list on my other screen so I can just make sure that I'm using the, um, the materials that are on that list. So start mixing your own glazes, <clears throat> a shopping list. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you the shopping list. So let's see, share, I'm going to share this. So just for context. Um, okay, so this is the shopping list that I'm referring to. Um, so we've got these base ingredients. So there aren't that many, but as I was saying, you can, um, these materials kind of represent a good portion of like the ceramics periodic table. And so um, the elements that we need to have in our glaze recipes for the glass formers and the fluxes can all mostly all be found within these materials. So we've got silicate, EPK, we've got one frit, 3124, grossly borate, nefsi, custer feldspar, whiting, talc, dolomite and zinc oxide. So this is the shopping list. Um, you can find this um, on my website. Uh, it's called Start Mixing Your Own Ceramic Glazes, a shopping list. So that is available there. And I'm gonna just move this over to another screen to refer to. And then I'm going to go back to Glazy. Okay. Um, so let's see here, which glaze. So I'm in my bookmark section, Cedar Hill glazes. Um, and so looking at these glazes, so I was saying that my black velvet can be made with the materials of the shopping list. So we've got Custer Feldspar, we've got Frit 3124, EPK Whiting, Nefsi, these are all on the shopping list, uh, and zinc. So EPK calcined, so that material isn't on the shopping list, but you can make your own calcined EPK. Um, so the only thing that wasn't on the list was cobalt. Um, and then, but then the rest of these recipes actually all contain ingredients that aren't on the list. So I'm just gonna go see, um, which one? Okay, so Anne is green, blue, green, pink, white. Okay, so let's start with this blue, green, pink here. So we call it blue, green, pink. It's mostly blue, green, but then when um, it's fired in reduction, the copper in the glaze turns red and it gives um, a pinkish color. So that's how it got the name. So I can click on this link here. Sue's blue, green, pink. And it's gonna pull up all the details of the glaze recipe. So um, when you're adding your recipe, you can give it a little description here. <clears throat> um, you can tell Glazy whether it's glossy or matte or semi-matte, um, whether it's transparent or opaque. So all of these things are um, information that you can upload to Glazy to make your recipes easier to find. And then <clears throat> here are the pictures. So this is the these are this is the picture that I uploaded. And then other people can also test these recipes and upload their photographs, which I think is really cool. Um, so here's blue, green, pink in reduction. I just recently added a few photos of it in reduction. And so this just shows you how copper um, in a reduction atmosphere actually turns red, whereas in 
uh, oxidation, it gives this blue-green color. So that is super cool. And then we've got the recipe down here. Um, and so we've got the base recipe here. And then you can add certain ingredients um, as, um, as additives. So they're not included in the base 100% of the recipe. Um, so they're additions. So we've got tin as an opacifier. Um, and then we've also got black copper oxide, which um, you can substitute copper carbonate for as well. Um, and you can do that using material substitutions that I'm about to show you. Do, do, do. So then um, you people can comment on the recipe. Uh, they can review the recipe. Um, and then you can look at the unity molecular formula and look at the chemistry of the glades. Um, and so this is the part where when you're reformulating a glaze recipe and substituting materials, you wanna make sure that the new recipe, the UMF matches the old recipe. So that this is the UMF here. So this is the information that we're going to wanna duplicate using different materials. Um, and then there's more um, so this is like, this is the unity molecular formula, meaning that all of the glass formula, <laughs> the glass formers are normalized to the fluxes. So all the fluxes add up to one. Um, the fluxes are in this column here. And so all these numbers add up to one. Um, and then all of the glass formers are in proportion to the fluxes. So here we have, this represents one mole of flux. So for every one mole of flux, we have 0.36 moles of alumina, and we have 0.17 moles of boron, and we have 3.23 moles of silica. So a um, bunch of chemistry to learn there. Um, and then we've also got the stull chart. So if you, if you watched my story time, I think it was two weeks ago, I talked a lot about this stall chart where it plots the silica and alumina levels on this chart and it kind of, you can kind of predict whether your glaze is going to be matte or glossy based on where it falls in this chart. So my recipe is the star in the center of this cluster and these are all kind of very similar recipes. So all the recipes that Glazy has that um, come really close to this recipe are going to show up there. And you can uh, zoom in and out here and drag the map around. So this blue green pink recipe falls in the glossy section. Um, so the matte section is over here where it's green. Uh, and then the white part is glossy. And then <clears throat> Um, so we've, we're right smack dab in the middle of the glossy section. And then if you keep scrolling down, you're going to see similar analyses. So any glaze that's uploaded into Glazy where the analysis kind of comes really close to matching, um, it's going to show those recipes here. Um, and then you can see which um, where this glaze has been bookmarked. So this glaze is in my bookmarks, Cedar Hill glazes. Um, if you want all of our, uh, the studio glazes from Cedar Hill Studio, uh, you can click on this bookmark and it will give you all of our glaze recipes. Um, okay, let me just look at the comments here. Lynn says, how do you substitute soda feldspar and manganese carbonate? in this recipe? Um, I would guess the link doesn't work. Um, okay, I will look at this recipe um, after I do this substitution, then Lynn, I'll check out your recipe there. Okay, so back to the top. So once you have a recipe, <clears throat> Oh, and it also shows revisions. So if someone takes my recipe, or if I take my recipe, and then I um, copy it and make some adjustments, then those adjustments will show up here as revisions, which is nice because then you can kind of see where 
uh, different recipes were derived from and how, they, uh, how they're connected. So if you want to, um, if you want to change a recipe or copy a recipe, then you want to click this button, Calculator. So I'm going to click Calculator. And what that does is it brings up my recipe, um, just the recipe and the UMF here. So I can see it easily. It plots it on the stall chart. So I don't have all those other recipes kind of um, in my way. I can just look at this particular recipe. Um, and then if I want to make a copy, I can just hit copy here. So this is where I think I need my screen to be a little bit bigger. Um, let me just make an adjustment. Let me see here. I'm going to make this bigger. I'm going to move this over. And then I'm going to, hmm, that doesn't really, that doesn't really work either. How can I do this? Nope. Okay. I'm going to have to go back to how I was. So it's a little, it looks a little bit nicer. <laughs> when it is um when you can see the whole screen so just bear with me here so here i've clicked this copy button and so it's basically just made a copy of my blue green pink recipe as it is um and then what i can do is so i've got the original umf here and then i'm going and then i've got the uh, the copied UMF here. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make some material substitutions and I'm gonna get the new recipe to match the old recipe. So I know, so I'm looking at my, um, my uh, shopping list. Let me just have a sip of water. <laughs> And I can see that min spar isn't on the list. <clears throat> and this, this part kind of takes a little bit of familiarity with what your, what your materials are made of. So I know that min spar is a soda feldspar and soda feldspar contains sodium, silica, and alumina. Um, so I, I'm going to use that information to decide what I want to substitute for min spar. So on this list, um, the closest material that I have, I could substitute minspar with custer feldspar. So minspar is a sodium feldspar, custer is a potassium feldspar, or I could use nepheline cyanite, which contains some sodium and a little bit of potassium. So I'm going to choose nephsi. Um, and I'm just going to leave the materials the same for now until I get, um, <clears throat> I'm going to leave the percentages the same and then I'm going to make those adjustments. I wonder if I can make this a little bit bigger. Just a sec. I really want you to see this nicely. That looks a little bit better. Okay, so I can't see your comments right now because I had to cover them up. Um, but we're just going to do this for now because that is a lot easier to look at. Okay, so we substituted minspar for nephsi. Um, as you can see, it's um, the UMF has changed. So we can't just do a straight substitution uh, because minspar and nephsi have different chemical analyses. So then we are gonna have to make adjustments to the rest of the recipe to kind of compensate for the difference between minspar and nephsi. So then frit 3134 is also not on the list. Um, so frit 3134 is a source of boron in a glaze recipe. Um, on the shopping list, we've got Frit 3124 as a source of boron, and we've got Gersley borate as a source of boron. So I think I'm gonna choose 
Grizzly Borate, um, which is actually quite similar. The chemical composition of Grizzly Borate is quite similar to FRIT 3134. Um, so I'm going to choose that. There's no correct answer. Um, it depends which materials you have. Um, so then we've got EPK, whiting, zinc, and talc. And I'm going to remove uh, the colorants for now um, because we're just dealing with the base recipe. Okay, so talc is on the list, zinc is on the list, whiting's on the list. Okay, so now we just have materials that are on the shopping list. So now I'm looking at the UMF and hopefully you can see that. I know the screen is really small and I apologize. I wish I could make it bigger. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna try a little bit. Uh, it doesn't really get bigger. So anyways, <laughs> we're making do. Hopefully you're not watching this on Instagram <laughs> on a tiny screen in the future. Okay, so um, we're looking at the UMF here and here. So usually the first thing, um, I usually leave the silica and alumina for last. And what you're going to find is when you start um, moving these numbers around, all the other numbers change and it takes a little bit to kind of get a feeling for what you need to adjust first. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the boron level. Um, so here we're at 1.73 and our new recipe we're at one point, or sorry, 0.173 and our new recipe we're at 0.194. Um, and I know that boron is coming from Gersley borate. So I'm just gonna reduce the boron until we're closer. So 0 0.175, 0 0.173. So now the boron is kind of similar. Um, now I'm gonna look at the fluxes. Um, and so we've got this R2O to RO ratio. That is the ratio of your primary flux, R2O, to your secondary flux, RO. Um, and those are just kind of like short form of abbreviations uh, based on the chemical formula. So um, our primary fluxes are in red here. We've got sodium and potassium. Um, so the oxides are written as Na2O, um, K2O. And so that's why R2O kind of represents um, anything that can be written as um, a letter, like two of that molecule plus one oxygen or atom, two sodium atoms to one oxygen atom two potassium atoms to one oxygen atom. Um, so we've got, and then here we've got R2O combined is 0.255. And down here we've got the R2O combined is 0.262. So I can lower the R2O by lowering the nephsi. And nephsi I know is um, where we're getting most of our um, sodium and potassium from in this glaze recipe. So if I just, I just move that down by a couple percentages and I'm watching these numbers change, um, the R2O. So now we've brought the NEF side down to 33. Um, the R2O and the RO are, are quite similar. So now I'm going to look down at the, the RO, so the blue these are our secondary fluxes. So we've got zinc, calcium, and magnesium. Um, and I'm looking at the zinc 0 0.12, 0 0.12, so we can leave the zinc the same, the calcium. Um, and I wanna make sure that the RO fluxes are in the, the same proportion to each other as in the original recipe, uh, because the RO flux is what determines the color response of the colorants that we add to the recipe. Um, and again, I can't see, I can't see your comments right now. So just bear with me and I'll go back and look at your comments. Um, so I wanna make sure that the calcium is closer to what it is here. So we've got um, whiting is calcium carbonate. 
So I want to bring the whiting up a little bit. So uh, we're watching this calcium number increase and I want to get it to 0.552 if I can. So now we're at 0.551. So that's pretty darn close. Um, the zinc has gone down a little bit. So I'm going to bring the zinc up. Um, so it kind of jumped a little too far. So I might go with uh, three, whoops, 3.5. So now the zinc is, is back to where we want it. Uh, the calcium is pretty close. Um, we have a little too much magnesium and talc is magnesium silicate. So then I can, if I want to lower the magnesium, I can just lower the talc here. Um, so I'm watching this magnesium number go up and down. So we want it at 0 0.073. It's at 0 0.084. Um, I'm going to go 1.5. So now we've got the magnesium matches. We've got the calcium matching, uh, the zinc. So we want these to be pretty close. They don't have to be like to three decimal places close. Um, I would probably try to get them to two decimal places close. Um, again, the zinc has gone up a bit, um, but I don't think that's going to be a big difference. <clears throat> so then we've made all these adjustments to our RO fluxes. Now we're going to go back and look at the R2O, which has changed. Um, so the sodium has come down a bit, so then I can increase the nephsi to bring that sodium back up. And you can see like, um, it's kind of, you kind of go back and forth where you bring, you bring, because the fluxes are all, um, <clears throat> the UMF is normalized to the fluxes. Um, they always add to one. So you can't increase a flux, one flux without everything else going down uh, because they're always going to add to one. So as I increase the nef side, the sodium and potassium go up, but then these numbers come down. So let's see, I would say that I could maybe add a little more calcium and a little more nef side. And now we are we're pretty close. So I'm looking at these individual numbers and then I'm also looking at this R2O to RO. This is the flux ratio. I want to make sure that it's fairly similar to what we have over here. So here point, this is like 0.26 uh, to 0.74. And here we have 0.26 to 0.74. So they're pretty close. I'm going to leave that for now because now we're going to adjust some other materials and everything else might go out of whack when we do that. So I don't want to be like too um, tedious in the beginning. Uh, we do all the fine tuning at the end. So now I'm going back to this boron level that I adjusted earlier. The boron has gone down. So I increased the, bor the Gersley borate to bring the boron up again. Um, and everything else looks to be still very close. So once I have um, the fluxes and the boron so that they're close to close enough to matching, then I start to adjust the silica and alumina. And the reason for that is because silica, <clears throat> um, so EPK or kaolin contains only silica and alumina. And so if I increase the EPK or decrease it, um, I'm not going to be affecting the fluxes at all. Um, so once the fluxes are set, then you can just, you can adjust the clay and the silica to get those um, alumina and silica levels to match. Um, and the fluxes aren't going to change at this point. So you always want to get the boron and the fluxes set first, and then you can do your adjustments to the silica and the alumina levels. Mm -hmm. And I always leave the silica to the very, very end um, because silica is a standalone ingredient where you can just add straight silica to your um, glaze and it's not going to add any other materials like alumina. So the alumina level is at 0.358 and here we have 0.38. So I'm going to bring the EPK down until we get to 0.358. 
358, which is about there, 0 0.36, 0 0.358. So those are about the same. And then finally, we've got the silica level, 2.4 over here, 3.23. So I'm going to increase the silica until I get to 3.23 or thereabouts. So there. Now we have this new recipe that matches and like it doesn't have to be, like I said, matching to three decimal places. I would try to get it um, pretty close to matching to two decimal places, which we've done so here. Um, the titanium, iron and phosphorus, those are just trace amounts. They're uh, 0 0.002, so I'm not really too concerned with those. Uh, for this recipe. So now we have two matching recipes. Um, and you can see that the total for this recipe is 126. So to get this recipe to add up to 100, we just hit 100%. Um, and it magically normalizes the recipe to 100 for us. And then you can even click this round button if you want it to round to one decimal place just to make it nicer to look at. And there we have it. <laughs> that is how you do a material substitution. Um, then you need to make sure that you save your recipe. Um, you can only do this once you're logged in. Um, so you want to make sure that you're logged in before you start uh, doing these calculations so that you have somewhere to save it to. So then I can hit save. And then this will save this new recipe into my Glazy account. So now let me go check on the comments um, <clears throat> and see what you guys are saying. <laughs> um, okay, Kate says, so Lynn, I'll get back to your recipe. Kate says, our company website's a good source to learn the composition of these materials. Um, there's lots of different places you could learn um, Glazy in itself. So, okay, let me show you something here. So when I click, I'm gonna get rid of this recipe just to make this bigger. So when I start typing something like Nefsi, it gives me the name. So it gives me three options for Nephsi. Um, Nepheline cyanide, this is just kind of the generic formula for Nephsi. <clears throat> this top one here is, is the Spectrum brand, Spectrum A270 brand of Nephsi. Um, it's mined here in Canada, I believe. And so the analyses are kind of different. And then there's Norwegian Nephsi as well. But you can see in these little tiny letters below the name of the material, it actually gives you the analysis. So you can see that NEFSI contains silica. So I think these are percentages, 60% silica, 24% uh, alumina, 10% sodium, 5% potassium. So that's one way that you can kind of get to know your materials. Um, again, so if I start typing in silica, it was 100% SiO2, which is silica. So you have to learn your periodic table first um, so that you know that Si uh, refers to silicon, and then SiO2 refers to silica, which is the oxide form. Um, so you can see here, talc is magnesium silicate, which is 63% silica, 32% magnesium. So in Glazy, um, on glazy.org, you can, you can start to learn what your materials are made of. I think this is amazing that he's included this here. Um, so you can take your original recipe and the material that maybe that you don't have. So say you don't have Gersley borate. Um, so let's just type up Gersley borate. So you can see Gersley borate is 15% silica. Um, oh, maybe they're not percentages uh, because I don't think it's, yeah, maybe it is 1% alumina, 27% boron, 4% sodium. So you can kind of, um, <clears throat> so you can see like, you wanna look at the, 
what the largest number is here. So in boron, um, we can see that it's mostly boron at 27% and then calcium at 19% and silica at 15%. So those are like the three main, when you're adding grossly borate to a recipe, you're mainly adding boron, calcium, and silica. Um, and then you've got little smaller percentages of other things. So you can start to study your materials using Glazy. Um, another really cool thing you can do is um, if I know that I need a boron source, I can start typing B2O3, which is the chemical formula for boron, the oxide, bor boron oxide. Um, so I've typed in B2O3, and here it shows me which materials contain high percentages of boron. So we've got borax, uh, which is boron and sodium, which I don't recommend using in a recipe because bora borax is water soluble, and we want to avoid water soluble materials whenever possible. Uh, but we've got culminate, 51% boron, frit, 3134 at 23% boron. So you can type in the oxide that you're looking for, um, and then it's gonna give you recommendations of materials that contain that oxide. So that can be a way that you can kind of start to get to know your materials um, and also figure out which materials. So um, say you, you're looking for calcium, you can type in CAO, and it gives you bone ash, which is calcium phosphate, um, synthetic bone ash, whiting, which is calcium carbonate, dolomite, which contains calcium and magnesium. Um, so glazy is a great way that you can kind of start to learn your materials. And then there's lots of books. Um, there's Clay and Glazes for the Potter by Daniel Rhodes. Um, I actually just got a great book out of the library, my public... <laughs> Uh, Potter's Dictionary of Materials and Techniques by Frank and Janet uh, Hamer. Hammer. Um, and it's amazing. I haven't looked at this book before, but I was reading through it last night. And it's a, it's a really good book. And I think this would be a great book um, to start getting to know your materials. Um, it talks a lot about chemistry. Um, so go to the library. Um, see, I, would, I just put all the books on glazes on hold so I could just see which books that I haven't really um, like books that I haven't noticed yet. Um, I just want to see what else is out there. Okay, back to the comments. Um, uh, Angelica, is there a list somewhere that tells you what ingredients contain what? Um, okay, I think I just answered that. Um, is there a starter list? Maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure of, of a list. Uh, maybe that's something that um, I would put together at some point in the future. Um, but yeah, I would maybe look into books. Um, I'm sure there's there's got to be websites. Um, maybe on Glazy. So if you click materials, um, you could click min you could type in min bar here um and so this is going to give you the analysis of min bar you can click on it i don't know if it um so you can see all the different names so min bar is a feldspar it's a soda feldspar um you can get some information on that you can see the analysis here um so there's lots of info on glazy.org, uh, similar analyses, Minspar. So all of these materials are similar to Minspar. So that's um, another way that you could kind of try to learn what your materials are made of. Um, another way is through the, um, like I would just take all the materials that you have and maybe you could look them up on Glazy and then you could um, label your buckets uh, with, with the oxides that those materials um, bring to the glaze. And then that's an, another way that you could start learning about them. 
Um, somebody asks, what zinc does when it is present in the formula? Yeah, so zinc is a flux. It's one of the secondary fluxes. So we have our primary flux and then our secondary fluxes. Um, so the secondary fluxes are the ROs. Um, so zinc is zinc oxide. ZNO is the formula for zinc. Um, so zinc is one of our secondary fluxes and fluxes are what bring down the melting temperature of our glass formers like silica and alumina that melt at very, very high temperatures. So we need to add fluxes to bring that melting temperature down. Um, somebody says, I've used that feature to help purchase a substitute ingredient. Super helpful. Yeah, Glazy is just getting better and better by the minute. Like it seems like Derek keeps adding new features all the time. Um, there's a target and solve function, which I'm not going to show you today, but um, basically, let's see. Um, basically, uh, you have to be a patron member of Glazy, um, which you can become by donating $2 a month. Um, and then you can take a recipe and then you can input the materials that you have and then it will do the material substitutions for you. Um, you just hit a button where you can solve a recipe um, where it will match the UMF of the original recipe using the materials that you tell it to use. Um, and then if, if it needs a material that you haven't put in there, then it will just pick one because you, you, you can't just create a material out of thin air. Like you need a source of calcium and you need a source of zinc. So if there's no zinc, um, you can't really get zinc from another material. You need zinc oxide for zinc. Um, but it'll actually, you just hit a button and it does all this that I've just taught you here today. Um, it does it all for you. So um, if you are a patron uh, of Glazy, then that's something you can play around with as well. Um, okay, so just looking in the comments, I wanted to look at Lynn's recipe. Do, do, do. Um, okay. Yeah, so Facebook doesn't like letting me uh, click on uh, the comments. I can't actually scroll back through the comments, but I see Lynn has posted recipe number 44096. So I can go into Glazy recipes and I think I should be able to 44096. I should be able to type in the recipe number. Yes. So when you make a recipe in Glazy, it assigns a number to it um, so that and no number is duplicated. So you can see there are current, there's at least 44,000 recipes in Glazy. Okay, so here is eggplant purple semi-gloss. Um, and so Lynn was wondering, how do you substitute soda feldspar and mag manganese carbonate. Okay, so soda feldspar. So are you saying, hopefully Lynn is still here. Um, please let me know, Lynn. Uh, you want to substitute soda feldspar because you don't have soda feldspar. Um, so soda feldspar can be substituted with minspar, um, which is a soda feldspar. Um, and that's generally the one that we get around here. Um, manganese carbonate, the only things that you can substitute manganese, like the colorants for, are, are the different forms of that colorant. So manganese comes in a, a carbonate form and a dioxide form. So you could substitute manganese dioxide for manganese carbonate, um, and you would just have you would adjust the percentages, which you can also do in Glazy. Um, but there's nothing else that you can substitute manganese for except for manganese. Um, so I just wanna see if Lynn is still here. No. Um, but so let's just go to the calculator with Lynn's recipe and we can substitute minspar for soda feldspar. So I click the calculator button and then I'm gonna click 
uh, calculator again. Um, and then I'm going to click copy. Oh, Lynn says you answered this perfectly. Okay. Well, anyways, I'll show you. <laughs> um, so we've got the original recipe here. And then I'm going to substitute mince bar over here. And I'm just going to drag this a bit bigger. So when I take soda feldspar and I substitute straight across for mince bar, now I'm looking at the, so the sodium levels. So over here in our original recipe, we've got sodium at uh, 0.243. And when I substituted mince bar, now our sodium is down at 0.147, but our potassium has come up quite a bit. And so because our materials are natural and they're mined out of the ground, um, a soda feldspar is going to be like the purest version. So when it's written in glazy as soda feldspar, that's kind of a generic chemical formula for um, a pure soda feldspar. But minspar is something that actually has come out of the ground and they've done a chemical analysis on it. And it is a soda feldspar, except it does contain a little bit of potassium, as you can see here. Um, but so to make these two recipes match, um, I would just need to increase the minspar. And I'm watching these flux levels go up. So I want to increase the mince bar. And I'm also looking at the flux ratio R2O to RO. So I want to get this 0 0.206 to match this 0.245. So I'm just going to go up, 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 up. And I'm watching this number go up until we get to 0.244. So that's close enough. Then I need to also look at my other materials and make sure that they're the same. So we've got our calcium has gone uh, gone up a little bit. So I can bring that. Let's see. The calcium has gone up and the ma magnesium has gone down. Um, so I could, I could uh, bring the magnesium up by increasing the talc. So I'm looking at the magnesium down here. Um, and then I could bring the dolomite down. Dolomite contains calcium and magnesium. Um, so we just have to play around a little bit here. Uh, but we can get it to be fairly close. And then I need to increase the, the sodium, or pardon me, decrease the mince bar a little bit. But you get the idea. And then um, and then I would need to bring the EPK down because the alumina level is too high. Um, so I've reduced the alumina. To So I've completely eliminated the EPK here to 0%. And we still have a little bit too much alumina. Um, so this would take some some tweaking actually to get this recipe to completely match. Um, I've been on here for well over an hour now, so I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up. But Lynn, I think, uh, I think Lynn got her answer from me. She says that I answered it perfectly. Um, so I'm just gonna stop there. Does glazy.org give you the information as of a glazed recipe is food safe. No, Glazy would not give that information. Um, there are just too many variables to determine whether a glaze is food safe. Uh, I'm just gonna close that. <clears throat> Does Glazy have safe, safety data sheets? No, but they're super easy. Um, if you just um, Google the name of the material and then write SDS after it, um, you should easily be able to find the safety data sheets. Um, and that's another way to get to know what your materials are made of um, and also which materials are hazardous um, to breathe in, to get on your skin. 
uh, what PPE is re required for handling different materials. So I always recommend um, that you, for all the materials you have in your glaze lab, that you print out the safety data sheets and have them handy, um, or at least look at them um, if you're going to be using glaze materials. Um, let's see, Facebook user says, if the base glaze has zinc and I add a colorant like copper, what can happen? Um, it totally depends on the rest of the material. So um, a recipe will contain zinc, but it's also likely to contain a lot of other fluxes that will impact the colorant. Um, and so a glaze that contains zinc and calcium, for example, might look different than a glaze that contains just zinc um, or a glaze that contains zinc and magnesium and calcium. So it's going to depend on um, all the materials that are in a recipe, what the how the color is color is going to show up. But what you can do is you can go into um, you can go into glazy.org. You can search for a recipe. There's even a spot where you can add a material. So you can say the glaze must contain zinc oxide. So you could do a search for all glazes containing zinc um, and then see which ones contain copper and see what color that they turn out um, and kind of uh, figure it out that way. Um, great. So I think that's all for today. Um, thank you all for joining me. Sorry, I can't. Um, hopefully I answered all your questions and I can't see some of your names, um, but thank you all for commenting. Um, and I hope you learned a lot and I hope you can go to glazy.org and maybe just play around with trying to um, like just take a recipe and see if you can match the UMF by like nudging materials up and down, see how the UMF changes. Um, and you're gonna kind of learn a lot just by doing it and trying it and seeing what happens. And that's what I did when I was learning this, I, I would spend hours like reformulating recipes because um, I just think it's super fun to do that. Um, some people, it might hurt your brain a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's um, once you once you know how to do this, then basically you can find any recipe um, and reformulate it to use the materials that you have available. For the most part, there's always exceptions. <clears throat> um, let's see. Lynn says you have a great way to explain these concepts. Now I have enough information and more confidence than before to explore my recipes further. Thank you, thank you, Lynn. I appreciate that so much. Okay, lots of thank yous. So yeah, I hope you have a great day uh, reformulating your glaze recipes. Um, if you need any help, just post your recipes into the Facebook group um, and then myself or someone else will would be happy to help you kind of figure out these reformulation calculations. Okay, so I will see you next time for story time. <laughs>